Okay, in this video, I'm going to continue on with my tutorials on magnetostatics. This is video number seven, and I'm going to derive the magnetostatic boundary conditions. The titles of the previous six videos in this section are written on the bottom left of your screen. In addition to those six videos, I'd like to note that in video 26, on my section on electrostatics, I derived the electrostatic boundary conditions. That video is very important to this current video. In fact, I've probably put more effort into describing the theory and the importance and so on of the boundary conditions and how they are in fact derived. So I strongly suggest and recommend that you watch video 26 on electrostatics prior to watching this particular video. So let's begin. The purpose of analyzing the boundary conditions is to try and analyze what happens the magnetic field in this case when it is incident upon a medium so let's see how much the magnetic field changes from one side to the other side of the medium and we need to analyze its perpendicular component to the medium itself and the tangential or parallel component so let's first analyze the perpendicular component of the magnetic field to it, the medium so I've drawn this situation on the top left of your screen. I've noted that we have the perpendicular component of the field above the medium itself and the perpendicular component below the field, excuse me, below the medium. I also have noted the surface current density K. Now, if you have watched the video on electrostatics, you realize that in order for us to calculate the perpendicular component, we must calculate the flux, which means we must calculate the divergence. Now, I'm sure you know the answer of this already because we know that there are no magnetic sources or charges, so the flux and thus divergence are going to be zero. But let's see what happens explicitly. In order to calculate the flux, we must create a Gaussian pillbox. So I've drawn a Gaussian pillbox on the medium itself here. The continuous orange line is above the top of the surface and the broken orange line is below the surface. Now, at the moment I've given, of course, the pillbox a finite thickness, but we can always limit that down and we have no contribution of flux from the sides and only from the surface. And of course, the surface is going to be of area capital A. And there will be two areas contributing, namely the one at the top here and the one at the bottom. So we know from Gauss's law from magnetism that the divergence of the magnetic field is zero. Via the divergence theorem, we can rewrite it, saying that the closed line integral of b dot dl is zero. But for the moment, that's just uh, of note and is not very important. So let's calculate the flux. Well, the flux is simply going to be the difference between the field on one side and the field on the other side multiplied by the area. And that's, that's equivalent to calculation of the divergence. So let's do that. So it's going to be the area outside of the difference between the perpendicular component on the top side of the medium and the bottom side of the medium. But we know, of course, that that's going to be zero, as Gauss's law says. That implies, because the area is non-zero, that the perpendicular component of the magnetic field on one side is equal to the perpendicular component of the mag magnetic field on the other side, implying we have a continuous perpendicular component of our magnetic field. This is contrast to the electric field, where we found that this was in fact discontinuous by an amount rho over epsilon zero. Now it's time to look at the tangential or parallel component. And I do this on the top right of your screen. So the method is very similar. This time we employ an Amperian loop. So note that we have the tangential component on the top side and the tangential component on the bottom side. So our Amperian loop has four sides to it and have Name or excuse me, number them one to four, and I've also indicated the direction in which the integral we will take will go. So we'll go, uh, in, as you look, it will go uh, clockwise. So if we look at segments one and three, so at the moment it looks like their contribution to the total integral will be non-zero, but I can assure you that we can shrink their size down to zero, and if that's the case, their contribution is going to be zero here. If we shrink their size down to zero, the contribution from lengths 2 and 4 will be non-zero. Let's calculate the contribution from lengths 2 and 4. Well, simply it's going to be the component of the magnetic field on the top or upside 
multiplied by the length of the integral. And we're going to get sim something similar for length 4, except the sign will be different. We're going to get minus b times l. And we have plus b times l here. So where do we go from here? Well, we need to calculate what the total uh, what the total line integral is going to be. So let's go ahead and do that. So we take the sum of the line segments, which is the essentially the same as our line integral, and I've written that in the top left of your screen. So what we have is we have L, the length, outside of B parallel or B tangential up minus B tangential down. But this is equivalent to taking the closed line integral of B dot DL, where we've shrunk the, the widths of two of the sides down to zero. But this is none other than Ampere's law. So this is very, this is equivalent. These two uh, statements are equivalent. So let's employ and invoke Ampere's law. Ampere's law says that closed line integral of b dot dl is mu zero times i, i being the current. But we can easily change the current and instead use the surface current density multiplied by the length. So that means we have mu zero times i, excuse me, mu zero times k times l is equal to l outside of the difference between the tangential components of the magnetic field. This all put together implies that the parallel component or the tangential component of the magnetic field is discontinuous either side of your medium by an amount mu zero times the surface current density. So what we've seen is the perpendicular component of the magnetic field is continuous the parallel component is in fact discontinuous. Now before we continue, at a risk of boring you, I'd like to remind you that we do not have any sources of magnetic field and that magnetism is caused by moving electric charges and as a result we don't have magnetism for stationary charges, stationary electric charges. I'd like to do a small bit of revision. When we discussed the electrostatic boundary conditions we were able to summarize the perpendicular and tangential conditions using one condition and I've done that in the top right of your screen. So we saw that the tangential component of the electric field is continuous but that the perpendicular component is in fact discontinuous. Employing the normal vector n hat to the surface we were able to summarize it in this particular way. Now it mightn't seem intuitive writing it this way but I can assure you if you think about it for a moment this will in fact be the case. What's important to note, by the way, is that n hat can be both positive and negative. So let's say this is our surface. n hat is going to be perpendicular to surface. Let's say this is positive n hat. You have to excuse my drawing, it's pretty poor. But that means that this would be negative n hat. And it implies that we, in this case for electric fields, we have positive and negative charges. We do something similar, of course, then for the magnetic field noting the slight differences in the actual conditions themselves. This time it is instead of a, a unit vector, um, it's, it's simply we use the cross product of the surface current density and the normal vector itself. Like I said, notice that n hat is positive if it's upwards and negative if it's downwards. So these, this is the magnetostatic boundary conditions. And if you're ever looking to analyze what happens, magnetic fields across as a boundary well, this is what you do. You analyze it using these boundary conditions. What remains for us to do is to analyze the boundary conditions for the magnetic vector potential, and I shall do that. A is fully continuous, and I'm going to show you why the magnetic vector potential is fully continuous. Let's look at the perpendicular component. It's very straightforward. We once again look at our Gaussian pillbox, which means we employ the uh, Gauss's law and also the divergence theorem. So I'm sure at this stage you'll understand that since the divergence of A is going to be zero, that means using the divergence theorem that the closed surface integral of A dot dA is also going to be zero. So we're going to get the difference between the two components of the uh, magnetic vector potential multiplied by the area is going to be zero, main, meaning that the perpendicular component is in fact continuous just like the magnetic field was. Looking at the tangential component, we have the exact same setup as we did for the magnetic field, which is here. So in order to do this, we need to look at the curl of the magnetic vector potential, which of course equals the magnetic field. 
we invoke Stokes' theorem, which brings us from a closed path integral to a uh, surface integral of the curl of our electric field, excuse me, our magnetic vector potential. Now, what's interesting here, and this, this is very much a trick, if we look carefully, what do we see? Well, we know that the surface integral of the curl of A can be written as the surface integral of B dot dA, B being the magnetic field. But this is none other than the flux of the magnetic field. Putting all of this together, what do we get? We get that the surface integral of B dot dA is the closed path integral of the magnetic vector potential dot dL is equivalent to calculating the magnetic flux. So in order for us to do this, let's use an Amperian loop, one illustrated on the bottom left of your screen. So you have the closed line integral, closed path integral of the magnetic vector potential dot dL is none other than the magnetic flux, which is itself none other than the magnetic field dotted with the normal and multiplied by the area. So we're going to get A tangential up minus A tangential down times L plus two terms, of course, from the smaller sides. And just like we did when we discussed the magnetic field, we can shrink these sides down to zero and get a zero contribution. So we can say that they will, they, at the end of the limit, they will go to zero. So I'm, for the moment, I'm going to ignore them. So that what we can say is in the limit, the closed surface, excuse me, the closed line integral of A dot dL is going to be A parallel up minus A parallel down. So this is going to be equal to zero and that is going to be equal to zero because the flux is going to be equal to zero and as a result what we can say is that the tangential component of the magnetic vector potential is continuous as it crosses a boundary both on the top and bottom side. So we can say that the magnetic field is discontinuous perpendicular it's continuous uh, excuse me, it's continuous perpendicular, it's discontinuous parallel, but that the magnetic vector potential is fully continuous on both sides. I'm not going to derive it, but I'll derive it, but in fact I'll just tell you that the, the derivative of the magnetic vector potential is itself discontinuous, but that's for another day. So thanks for watching, please pass it on to your friends, subscribe to my channel, and you might also give me a comment in the comment box below.